Hello, hello, hello. It's Attorney Mike Garvin coming to you from Chicago as usual. And it was a weird one today. It was a weird one. I was trying to find clips and they were all weird. I don't know the, the sentencing. I have to thank Chadaska Dumb and Lauren, the pet lover. And I found some other stuff. Everything was weird. <laughs> I'll be interested to see what you guys say about this. Let's get it started, shall we? Challenge the charges in a court of law to confront your accuser. You will not have the opportunity to present any defenses or mitigating factors, and you will not have the opportunity to have the state carry its burden to prove the charges against you beyond a reasonable doubt. Are you prepared to give up these rights? Yes, ma'am. You understand that you will be on probation for up to 24 months, less 137 days. Is that your under sorry, sorry, yes, less 137 days. Is that your understanding? Yes, ma'am. How do you plead to a criminal trespass and damage to property from July 12, 2022, in case 22CR5538E? Yes, ma'am. How do you plead? What, what do you mean, how do I? Guilty. Are you guilty or not guilty? To guilty, guilty ma'am, I'm sorry. versus Meadows, there's Kedrick Williams, file 117 MA 683. Keep an eye on bottom right. He's he's a whole vibe. Read 1982 as one of the authorities to uh, <clears throat> allow a termination of tenancy <clears throat> in the face of a threat of retaliatory eviction. So shame on me, I didn't read the case carefully enough. What it says is that the expiration of the term lease, the landlord can seek termination of the tenancy based on the expiration of the lease. Once it converts to a month-to-month -month tenancy after that, uh, the defense of retaliatory eviction is available. And apparently, Mr. Rognes conceded that point, so I don't think the hearing was very long in circuit court. I'm not sure. But anyway, the matter was remanded back to this court. <clears throat> um, the defendant, Paula Williams, is here with me. Kedrick Williams, can you hear me? Yes. Are you wearing a shirt? No, sir. I just... You can't come to court with us. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hold on one second. Here dealing with two kids. I apologize. I'm sorry. Two babies. I'm not sure what that has to do with not wearing a shirt, but you're here. You have pants on? Yes. Okay, good. <clears throat> good morning. What's your name? Okay, uh, unmute. You need to unmute, please. A little hard of hearing. What's Is your name? Marcia. Marcia. M A R C I A. Louise Bowers. B O W E R S. But you've been calling me Messed, which is my maiden name. Well, I haven't been calling you anything. I'm just meeting you now. Okay. Bowers. That's number five. That's number five. Well, I don't think I have one this one. Sister Tish? Yeah. Seven No, I got number four. Uh -oh. That's all. Mm -hmm. 
You have to engage with them for their documents. My <laughs> kids? Yep. Okay. There's one out. And your name is Mr. Again? Okay, Ms. Bowers, you're charged with domestic violence disorder conduct. Is there a Paul Bowers uh, on this call? Yeah. That's my husband. Okay, um, Mr. Bowers, you want to say something? Ma'am, ma uh, let me listen um, to him. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I uh, just wanted to say that I, I just want to have my wife back home. To, it's my to intent to release her. Pardon? Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Oh, good Lord. You probably can't hear it. But her husband comes on and says, I just want my wife back home. Please return Cornholio to me. All right. Um, I'm going to impose a condition that you not commit any acts of domestic violence, ma'am. I am going to release you. Your court date at Oro Valley City Court is April 24th at 10.30 a.m. Okay, you should be released uh, today. Okay, you're excused. Love, and new. Mr. Valencia, you're charged with drive-by shooting and prohibited possessor. This guy is just hardened. That's the only, it's short, but it's the only reason I put it in here. They they read a, some nasty stuff about him. He does not blink. He does not flinch. He does not care. At a minimum, I'm going to order that you have no contact with the alleged victim. Stay away from the incident location. Do not possess any firearms or other weapons. And don't possess or consume any alcohol or illegal drugs. County attorneys recommending I hold you on a $100,000 bond with pretrial services supervision. If that bond is posted, we'll hear from defense counsel. Uh, Judge, I would ask for a reasonable bond of $1,000. Okay. We'll hear from the uh, county attorney. Anything to add? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Just as I noted in my um, <clears throat> recommendation, it's case pending in a subsequent drive-by shooting offense and also another drug sales offense. It looks like this was in the middle of a crime spree, including two two drive-by shootings. Uh, just know he's got a history of probation violations, has uh, five, at least five prior felony convictions, and has an active NC, uh, NCBA card. All right, so I'm going to follow with the state's recommendation, $100,000 bond with pretrial services supervision posted, cooperate with pretrial services. Your next court date is April 15th at 1.30, and the public defender is appointed to represent you. Your excuse, sir. Let's go ahead and have yeah, he's like, okay, so I'm I was out on uh for doing a drive by. I did another drive by and got and and got popped for selling drugs. And he's like, Yeah, that sounds like me. <laughs> he takes a slip of paper and walks out. All right, this is the main event. This is just weird. I don't know what to make of it. I, I, I'm curious to what you guys are going to think. Some argument regarding sentence. Uh, I'd like to hear from the people first. The people have uh, an argument they wish to make. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, Mr. Aikens, looking at his record from the PSI, has over 20 misdemeanors. 
better convictions. He has 12 substance abuse. Um, uh, of those, there's 12 substance abuse convictions that are actual substance abuse, whether it's marijuana, drunk driving, things like that, MIPs, um, and possibly some of the other ones like malicious destruction, failure to report it could be part of that as well. He has four OWIs. The reason why I'm talking about this is obviously a third and a fourth would be felonies. He has a resistant obstruct, which was a misdemeanor in Idaho. Um, and here in Michigan, that would also be a good felony. Idea. Um, so really we're looking at felonious behavior for which he's never received a prison sentence, Your Honor. Uh, he is definitely, well, let me rephrase that. Uh, I believe he deserves a prison sentence at this time. His original uh, guidelines were 5 to 23, and that maxed out the PVs on misdemeanors and it didn't account for all these other misdemeanors that he has as well. Uh, so that is one reason to exceed the guidelines on the probation or on the um, PVs for that. Additionally, his medical report That's kind is of extremely telling and this is probably the most important thing. So I'm just going to highlight that because there's there's just so much in here um, that he remembers a lot of these things, but this is what he tells. This is on seven of eight, and it starts with on two eight twenty four. So on two eight twenty four, attempted to talk with nurse regarding his seizure, i.e., hands locking and curling to his chest with inability to speak. Nurse advice sounds like an anxiety attack. However, to discuss with doctor, he stated, I need something worse sounding to tell the judge. It won't sound bad enough saying I had a panic attack. On his discharge, discharge documents, this is for the EEG report completed on 2-124, and it said in this, that it produced no abnormal EEG activity. Additionally, on the page after that, it shows that there were no issues with his, um, no abnorm abnormalities with uh, cerebral, I, I don't even know how to say that word, um, with his brain. And then it says, issues for follow-up pending results. I do feel a higher dose of Depakote ER would be helpful in addressing some of his persistent manic symptoms. Your Honor, looking at all these things, it looks like that's exactly what's going on. These are manic symptoms. They are not seizures. He remembered what was going on and now states he doesn't remember. Additionally, the seizures that he's talking about supposedly wipe out his memory for days at a time. Um, I'm not a doctor. I've never heard of that, however, and there's been no medical evidence to support that seizures wipe out that much, uh, we'll call it disassociation. Um, and Everything in here is him not taking responsibility. I believe at one point he says that he was forced into taking a plea because other charges were going to be added. Um, he also, uh, and, and he says he doesn't want probation. Your Honor, I don't, I don't want to give him probation either. I don't want to give him parole. I think he just needs to sit at the max for the four year, um, which would be two years and I think eight months, um, or we'll say two years, six months, and uh, he, he deserves prison. Uh, and that's it, he deserves prison. All right, thank you. Let's go ahead and hear from you, Mr. Traeger, allocution, please. Yes, Your Honor, Mr. Akins is prepared to make a statement in allocution if that's what you'd like to hear at this time. 
I'd like to hear your argument regarding sentence, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, we believe ultimately that jail time uh, served by Mr. Aikens thus far following these probation violations is sufficient. We believe that if the court believes that uh, a that's what you want to wait for. You, you want to wait for, for this guy to talk for himself. It's out there. Message must be sent to Mr. Aikens concerning the importance of taking responsibility and, and the seriousness of the offenses for which he is to be sentenced today then that additional time should be measured uh, in days of jail and not in weeks or months, uh, and certainly should not result in his imprisonment. So I think it's important to first take a step back and understand, uh, as the court knows, what it is sentencing Mr. Aikens for today. None of this is meant to uh, minimize the degree to which he has been criminally comp or excuse me, has been criminally um, responsible for his actions in the past or intended to minimize the the offenses for which he should be sentenced today. He does have a long history uh, with law enforcement that's borne out in the record as well as in the argument of the prosecutor. However, what's important to keep in mind is is what he's being sentenced for today are these four violations of his probation uh, circumstances which are effectively abusive language uh, and treatment towards staff members at Crystal Mountain, abusive language with the Leelanau Sheriff, a small amount of marijuana that was found on his person upon arrest weeks after his medical marijuana card had expired, and destruction of neighbor's property, uh, which is the, the, the malicious destruction that is uh, charged and he pled guilty to in these cases. And although those are serious offenses and, and criminally you know, things that he is criminally responsible for, ultimately, sir, we believe that, that the context is appropriate to understand that the abusive language is just language. And although it's that, that does not make it uh, OK, that's effectively just the language that Mr. Aikens used with those parties. It's a small amount of marijuana and it's some destruction of his neighbor's property. But even outside of that context, sir, there's there's key mitigation, I think, in this case that lends itself towards a belief that the jail time he has served is sufficient. And, and simply, if a you know, more serious punishment is required, it should be measured in, in jail days, not weeks or months. The mitigation, sir, is that I think it's apparent from the record that Mr. Aikens suffered significant lapses in his mental health. Uh, he describes them as seizures. Other people experience them as seizures. Whether they were truly medically seizures as we think about them as non-medical providers is, I, I think, still to be determined. But ultimately, uh, we do believe that he experienced periods of significant lapses of his mental health, which may be explained by his bipolar diagnosis which includes uh, a diagnosis that he experiences bouts in, in times of, of mania with psychotic features. Uh, so whether we call them seizures or mania with psychotic features, ultimately those lapses in his mental health are, you know, his criminal behavior in violating the probation uh, is attributable in large part to those lapses. You can see that, sir, in uh, the supplementary, supplementary materials that we provided to your honor. The statement from Mr. Keyes, which is page three of our submission in paragraph three, talks specifically about what Mr. Keyes witnessed, Mr. Aiken's behavior, uh, grasping at his chest, saying things that were extremely off the wall and odd, <clears throat> describing Mr. Aiken's behavior is, quote, a crazy experience for me, me being Mr. Keys. And you also see it, sir, in the um, in the statement from Ben Voigt, the neighbor whose property was destroyed, in which he describes in detail having seen him convulsing with his arm shaking and kind of being in a position where it, it appeared as if he was suffering some psychological break, I believe, is what Mr. Voigt describes. Ultimately, uh, whether it was a seizure or something else, uh, the diagnosis that he received was for bipolar one disorder, 
with ma with mania that included psychotic features. And the reason, sir, that we included at page eight the American Association of Psychi Psychi Psychiatric Pharmacists report regarding the medication involved is because Depakote is the medication that he's been prescribed uh, after receiving this diagnosis. I believe the probation violation recommendation report speaks to it being uh, what he calls his happy pills, ultimately very clearly addressing his lapses in mental health. And what you'll see in that document as well is that under this diagnosis and the reason that Depakote is prescribed is because individuals can uh, experience periods of mania when they have bipolar disorder that includes racing thoughts and getting involved in activities that are risky or could have bad consequences, as well as a, a feeling that you don't have to sleep, which you'll see in the records in this case, uh, an absence or lack of sleep seems to precipitate a lot of Mr. Aiken's misconduct. And so we think the key mitigation, sir, is in the lapses of mental health. We also think, sir, that there is mitigation in this case in Mr. Aiken's past declaration of remorse or understanding of the, the negative parts of his behavior. You'll see that, sir, in uh, the email between the Director of Risk Management at Crystal Mountain to uh, Agent Myers concerning Mr. Aikens. That's at pages five and six of our supplement. In that document, it talks about how uh, Mr. Aikens called Crystal Mountain after the abusive behavior that he exhibited and clearly apologized to them, telling them that it was none of his, their staff's fault. Uh, there's one line at page six where uh, Mr. B Crystal Mountain's legit place. <clears throat> I've been there many, many times. In fact, if you go on my community tab, I have a picture of me skiing with my father at Crystal Mountain. I'm intimately familiar with this situation, which makes it actually weirder because it's a, it's a very, yeah, I don't know, mellow sort of civilized kind of place. Bolduck, the director of risk management, says that he asked him about his phone call this morning to our member services office, and Mr. Aikens acknowledged the call and apologized, said that he was worked up and was sorry for the call. Ultimately, this seems to indicate that Mr. Aikens, even close in time to these offenses, was remorseful for his actions and that other people's kind of understood I wouldn't go so far as to say forgiveness in any way, shape, or form, but at least understood the position that he was in. And that holds true for Mr. Voigt as well, the neighbor whose property was destroyed. Uh, in that, that letter that he wrote late last night to our office, which we provided to you, he specifically says uh, that he believes Jeremy is a hardworking man, that if he can get rehabilitated, can be an immense gift to our yes. local economy and our the client he is building for. Just and so ultimately, we believe that the remorse and, and kind of understanding of Mr. Aiken's past behavior is evident in this case. When you take that in the context of the offenses for which he should be actually sentenced as part of this probation violation procedure, uh, we believe all that mitigation is clear, and especially regarding his lapses in mental health. The last thing I'd ask you to consider, sir, with regard to the context of the offenses is that although this does not necessarily forgive his actions, one of the things to keep in mind is that he does face pending charges uh, in another county regarding specifically the destruction of his neighbor's property. Therefore, to the extent that he might face further uh, sentencing or, or felony charges for that particular offense, you know, today is about sentencing him for the probation violation and not necessarily the, the underlying act for which he continues to face felony charges in another county. The last thing I'd ask you to consider, sir, is the incentives that Mr. Uh, Aikens has today to come out of jail and reform the, his behaviors. Not only is he now medicated properly to address his bipolar medic or excuse me, diagnosis, uh, he does have a, a son, as the record shows, that he hasn't seen for some two months. Uh, and he has a substantial business that he leads. That's uh, evidence in the 
the letter from Mr. Keyes as well, which talks about how uh, Mr. Aikens employs a number of contractors who do work in the local community building other people's homes. And in the absence of uh, Mr. Aikens, that business has been suffering uh, because he's not available as a supervisor. He's not available for certain tasks that require his signature. And ultimately, he's not available to build new business for those employees that he does employ and support. And so ultimately, do I think that those things, his son and his business, should have been top of mind at the time of some of these behaviors? Absolutely. But still, as we sit here today with the prosecutor asking for uh, a term of imprisonment, uh, those, I think, are, are factors that weigh in favor of uh, the jail time he served being sufficient and if any additional time is required being measured in a matter of days in jail so that he can get back to his son, get back to his family, and get back to his business. So ultimately, sir, that's all I have for the court this morning. Again, thank you for your time. All right, uh, Mr. Akins, uh, if you have anything you'd like me to know, I'd be glad to hear from you, sir. Buckle up. It looks like you're about to read something. That's fine. Uh, just read slowly so we can make sure we get everything in the record. We can proceed. And you're muted right now, uh, so we're going to need the... Uh, there you go. We've got the officer to unmute. Thank you. All right, Mr. Akins, if you could go ahead and begin. And you're still on mute, officer. I'm going to hit the hashtag. Now I can hear him. All right, Mr. Higgins. Well, I could hear him. Now I can. Can you hear me now, Your Honor? I sure can. You can go ahead and proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. In November of last year, I bought a camper and moved out of our home. I now live in a camper alone, which is absolutely heartbreaking for me. I miss so much coming home to my son running into my arms. In December of last year is when my health issues began. I lost consciousness while standing on a ladder at work. I went to my doctor and she referred me to a heart and vascular doctor. January 8th is when I started to slipping it, mentally. I was convinced that the home we were at was full of demons. I went and got my son and his mother and checked them into a hotel. I went back to the home and blessed the home trying to get rid of the demons. When I returned to the hotel, my son's mother said, you are acting crazy and left with our son. I was January 10th is when I experienced my first seizure occurred. I was staying at Crystal Mountain. That morning I woke up feeling ill. I called my foreman and asked him to come pick me up and take me to our job site, which was about two miles from Crystal Mountain. Once we arrived at the site, I was in his truck. I started shaking really hard and throwing up. I told Travis to take me back to my room at Crystal. When we pulled out onto the highway from the job site, my hands were shaking uncontrollably, then started tingling and burning like the blood circulation was cut off. Then they locked up and, I, and couldn't move them. I looked at Travis and told him to stop the truck several times. He didn't look at me and that's when I realized I was not speaking. I remember looking back at the road terrified, then I black out. When I come back to, we were pulling into Crystal Mountain. I'm looking at my hands and my fingers started twisting up. My hands then went to my chest and I could not move. I remember Travis come around and open my door. I stepped out of the truck and was hunched over and could barely move my legs or walk. We were parked at a sidewalk that led to a, the pool and spa area. It's about 50 feet long. I was trying to get in there to get help. About halfway there, Travis came up to put his hand on my shoulder. I remember screaming in terror. I thought he was the devil. I could barely hear him speak. He said, hey, buddy, do you want to go for a walk? And then a feeling of peace came over me, and I thought he was God, and, went, and I was dying. I turned around and could see his truck. He then said, I don't think I can park there. Again, terror set in in my mind. I had to get away from him. I remember turning around, then I black out. When I come back to, I'm trying to open the door to the spa. The handle is shaped like a C. I couldn't get my hands away from my chest. I bent over and used both hands to get around the door handle and then was scooting backwards to open the door. 
I black out again when I come to. I'm sitting in a chair in the spa lobby with a robe on my lap, and people were gathered around me. I could see their lips moving, but I could not hear anything they were saying. I kept saying, I need help, I need help, but again, I realized I was not speaking. I have no idea how long this went on for. The next thing I know, a security guard was sitting in a chair next to me telling me I can't be in there. I remember getting up and going in the spa locker room, getting in a robe and going to the outdoor hot tub. That's what calmed me down and brought me out of it. The next afternoon, January 11th, I went to the barber shop in Beulah to get my beard trimmed. I had never done that before, so I thought I would give it a try. I arrived around 4.30 p.m. and was his last customer for the day. Once I was done, I could not find the keys to my truck. I called the Wednesday bus for a ride back to Crystal Mountain. When the bus got there, I got on and sat directly behind the bus driver. As we were traveling, my hands started shaking and I could feel the same thing happening as the day of before. I remember grabbing my Bible out of my backpack and praying I was terrified. I black out. When I come to, I'm extremely confused. We were dropping people off at their house. I asked the bus driver if we were going to Crystal Mountain. He yelled at me and said, yes, stop asking me that. I've already told you we are. I started traveling again and my hands are locked to my chest. My right hand is inside the pages of my Bible locked to my chest. I black out. When I come to, we are pulling into the entrance of Crystal Mountain. I'm absolutely terrified again as my hands are still locked to my chest. I can feel myself about to puke. I remember kept, I kept asking the driver for a trash can, but again, no words are coming out. Right as we pull into the hotel lobby, I puked on the floor, but the crazy thing is no one noticed, even the driver. It was like I was in a dream. I don't remember getting off the bus. I remember walking through the lobby. My hands were still locked to my chest inside my Bible, and I could hear the driver yelling at, at me, you better pray to a higher source. I thought he was a demon and wanted to get away. I remember wandering through the halls, very confused. I had no idea where my room was or what I was doing or what I was doing. I remember making it back to the lobby to get to guest check-in. I told the lady I'm in room 2426. She said, no, Mr. Akins, you're confused. You're in suite 205. You gave me a key. Again, I, I wandered the halls for a long time, very confused. Eventually, I found my room. I then got in the shower and stood in the hot water for around an hour to get calm. When I got out, security was knocking at my door. I invited them in to search the room. I told them I had no drugs or alcohol. They came in, searched my room, and left. The next evening, I booked an Airbnb near Crystal Mountain. My foreman, Travis, was helping me and driving me. At this point, I was too nervous to drive and had lost my keys. I also had lost my mood stabilizer, Selexa. He helps me get checked into the Airbnb, which is next door to the owner's uh, home. Scott is his name. Once I got there, Travis left and I called my mom and was trying to tell her I'm having some sort of medical issues, but there was bad service and it was a really heavy snowstorm. I remember when my hands started shaking right then, it was like someone grabbed my arm and threw the phone and I black out. I don't know if this next part really happened or if it was a hallucination, but I remember being outside and I could hear voices telling me my son was in a car accident. I then heard the cars crashing. I ran to the front uh, door of Scott's home. The top half of the door was glass. I was told to break the glass. I could remember hitting the glass three times as hard as I could. It didn't, it didn't break. I remember walking through the front yard. I could hear the voices. They told me who my mom, my dad, my brother, and my son were. Then I black out. I don't know if this is real or not to this day. When I come back to, I'm standing in the Okay. <clears throat> of all this of all this tale, I was I was on board with it, sort of. But when he says, I don't know if this is true to this day, well you're 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 saying that you've come to meaning you've come back to reality. Have you asked anybody about this stuff? Have you asked, you know, your son if he was in an accident or anything? That's just, it's a bridge too far for me. I shot with the homeowner. I was hunched over with my phone in my hand. I kept pointing to my charger outlet on my phone. I was saying my son has been in a car accident. My knuckles on my right hand were busted up and bleeding. 
I remember he handed me two chargers. I turned back to the Airbnb. I remember seeing the front door, then I blacked out. When I come back to, I'm standing in the shower. I kept being told to get behind the waterfall. I was dying. Everybody goes through this to go to heaven. This went on for what seemed like an hour or two. I black out again. When I come to, I'm locked inside the, this bedroom in bed. I have no idea how that happened. I'm told I'm dead. I'm in my coffin. Everyone is gathered around me at the viewing and that I died in a car accident. I kept being told to focus on the light, to see God, and to go to heaven. I was told everyone goes through this to get to heaven. This went on all night until sunrise. Once the sun came up and I realized I'm still alive, I text the owner. He come and unlocked the door and was apologizing to me. I said, no problem. Let me stop you for just a moment, sir. I apologize for doing so. You're essentially reading, now there's a few differences, but you're essentially reading the document that's already been provided to me uh, as part of the um, uh, probation violation recommendation report. Uh, you described the violation and, uh, and did so in the same kind of detail that you are providing again today. Uh, I don't think that's necessary. Uh, what I would really like to hear from you is, uh, is uh, anything that you think would be helpful to me in making a decision regarding sentencing you today, sir? Um, the fact that I own, I own two different companies. One is Clearwater Framing, one is Clearwater Builders. Uh, Clearwater Builders, I'm currently building two homes. One is for a local company with three children, I mean a local couple with three children. We poured the foundation on that home in the middle of December. It has sat stagnant since then because I'm the only one who can get the draws through the bank as the general contractor. The other project is the McGathy residence. It's for a retired couple out of Indiana. We, had, we hung the sheetrock on that home in the middle of February. That home has also sat stagnant because I'm the only one who can get the draws from the bank and keep the, keep the project going. Um, this Monday, we're supposed to start two projects for my framing company that the builder will not let us start unless I'm present on site. And also the fact that my child's mother is, was denied all benefits from the state and is solely dependent on me for income. And last night I spoke to her, she's down to $300 and we have no idea what to do if I was sent to prison. And also for the seizures, my doctor wrote right here, functional neurological disorder or conversion disorder. Conversion disorder is caused by stress, emotional stress, emotional trauma, and physical trauma. It can cause paralysis, numbness, deafness, and seizures. During the seizures, patients experience paralysis, deafness, difficult walking, numbness, difficult speaking, and memory loss, which is what I keep calling the blackouts. I've also done research that bipolar disorder goes hand in hand with schizophrenia or schizofast. The causes are life changing, losing someone close to them and stress. The symptoms are delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech and trouble with thinking, which is everything that I experienced. Your Honor, I'm asking if I have to do more jail time to please grant me a work release so that I can continue my companies and continue to build my homes. I've also apologized several times and spoke to Ben every day when I was in the hospital. He told me the damages were $16,800, which I've already satisfied that payment to him. And I've given him full access to my crew and my equipment to help anything that I've done. And I plan to repair or help do anything I can once I'm released. That's all, Your Honor. All right, thank you, sir. <clears throat> well, before me today is uh, Jeremy Akins. He's here for sentencing on a probation violation. I, he was uh, convicted back in 2021 of assault with a dangerous weapon. We call that felonious assault. That's a four-year felony here in the state of Michigan. Uh, the court uh, sentenced him, I believe, in 2023 in that case. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the sentence uh, included uh, a jail sentence. I put him on uh, community corrections, which he uh, immediately failed and wound up going back to jail to serve time.
Uh, he does have a total of 258 days of jail uh, sentence uh, that he's already served. That will be credited against any any uh, additional sentence that the court imposes at this time. Uh, the reason he's here uh, is because he violated his probationary order. That probationary order had the standard restrictions in place uh, and I uh, violated them in the following way. The malicious, maliciously destroyed property belonging to his neighbor, Mr. Boyd, who we have already discussed. Uh, he did that uh, in January of 2024. Also, uh, on the same date, he engaged in threatening, abusive, or intimidating behavior. Uh, and then on the 17th of January 2024, he engaged in threatening, abusive, or intimidating behavior with Crystal Mountain Resort staff. Ultimately, he was uh, brought in, and when he was brought in on the probation violation uh, on January 22nd of 2024, he was uh, in possession of marijuana uh, in the form of marijuana wax that he's apparently continued to smoke. Um, he, uh, he's uh, been a challenge for probation, there's no doubt about it. Uh, he, he's a challenging individual. Uh, on the one hand, he has a business that appears to be when he's uh, sober and when he is working effectively, uh, it appears to be not having psychotic breaks as he has been uh, for a period of time. I, it's been a successful business. He has jobs lined up. Uh, apparently there's no one else in the organization that's able to complete those jobs because of his position as the owner uh, and uh, he has access to the funding for completion of those projects, uh, and so those uh, those projects are remaining fallow at this time, which is certainly unfortunate. Uh, but um, uh, it is uh, a direct result, frankly, of the behavior that he's been engaging in, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. Before I do that, though, I want to point out that the defendant does have a significant prior record, including uh, 20 convictions for misdemeanors. Uh, including for drunk driving or uh, intoxicated driving arrests. The guidelines in the underlying case were 5 to 23 months. So the defendant in this case uh, engaged in uh, some, uh, as his uh, attorney indicated, some uh, statements to other parties. Uh, yes, they were just statements, but they were also coupled in, in some occasions with actions that were, uh, were very, very concerning. Uh, for example, uh, there was uh, the episode that is described on uh, page 7 of 8, uh, where he uh, used a uh, torch apparently to light his camper on fire in order to gauge uh, the potential response time to an emergency from local police and law enforcement. Uh, that is a, a matter of significant concern uh, to the court. Uh, further, uh, the report uh, details uh, his um, uh, communications with uh, a nurse on the 8th of February 24, where uh, the nurse indicated that uh, his uh, uh, his symptoms appeared to be an anxiety anxiety attack. Uh, at which point the defendant indicated that it needed to be something more significant uh, so that uh, the judge would be appropriately affected. Uh, my words, not his, but that's essentially what he said. Uh, and that a panic attack wouldn't be that. Uh, uh, that certainly concerns me. It makes it appear that he's gaining the system in order to try to advantage himself. Um, and further of concern to me is the fact that he continues to self-medicate uh, with cannabis, uh, as far as we know, uh, in order to, uh, uh, pardon me, uh, which uh, the court uh, has significant concerns about given the, the nature of his uh, psychotic breaks and uh, what those psychotic breaks tend to manifest in. As I said, he makes uh, chilling threats to people uh, that he's associated with, both at Crystal Mountain certainly to the police uh, that were just doing their job. He threatened to hunt them down and kill them. 
Uh, he threatened to rape the female officer. I'm not going to go into detail about that, but it was vulgar. Uh, and uh, 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 in addition, uh, we have the damages to the Boyd property. I did read Mr. Boyd's uh, comments, and Mr. Boyd is uh, clearly a very charitable person caring about his neighbor. Uh, and uh, I take that into consideration in terms of coming up with a defense or pardon me, an appropriate sentence in this case. I'm not clear as to exactly what the uh, physical uh, ailments that the defendant has. Uh, he's talked about a heart ailment uh, in great detail. He's talked about, obviously, his uh, mental health in great detail. It's difficult on this record to come to a conclusion as to exactly what is going on with him. I'm not sure if, if he knows exactly what's going on with him. What I do know is that his continued behavior to his family, to his neighbors, uh, to law enforcement in particular, uh, have been significantly violent of his probation order. Uh, he's been difficult. Uh, he's been difficult for the probation office to manage. Uh, and uh, as such, the department is uh, requesting that uh, the court sentence him pursuant to the underlying conviction for assault with a dangerous weapon to an MDOC term. The guidelines here are five to 23 months. I think those guidelines are proportionate, as I indicated, the original sentencing. Uh, the defendant has served uh, in the neighborhood of eight months thus far. Uh, I think that uh, he's outgrown us. Here, uh, he needs to uh, understand that this behavior uh, towards law enforcement, towards uh, his family, towards neighbors, uh, is, uh, is significant enough uh, to uh, warrant a prison sentence. Uh, he needs to understand that this is the likely result of any continued behavior similar to what's occurred. Uh, and uh, as I said, I think he's simply outgrown our ability to be able to address uh, the violations that he is engaged in, and of course the underlying offense here. So uh, while the, uh, the uh, prosecutor's office wants a maximum sentence, and in fact has argued for uh, exceeding guidelines, uh, this is the first time that the defendant will be uh, undertaking a MDOC sentence. I think that uh, the better approach is something more measured. Uh, so the court is going to uh, sentence the defendant to 16 to 48 months in the Michigan Department of Corrections. The defendant has 258 days of credit. That credit will be uh, credited against <coughs> that prison sentence. <coughs> Pardon me. Since the defendant has not been able to work, I'm not going to assess any additional fines and costs at this time. Are there any questions uh, at this time with regard to the sentence for the defense? No, Your Honor, thank you. For the people, uh, just one, uh, and it will come out on parole rather than, um, is it going to be just a straight jail sentence or will he come out on parole? Well, parole is up to uh, the parole department. Uh, I'm sentencing him to a minimum of 16 months. Whatever happens after that point is up to the FEOC okay. based on their procedures. I think you're advised, so if you wish to take action, you have the ability to do so. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. All right, uh, Mr. Akins, I, I'm also advising you that you do have the right to appeal this conviction in the sentence I've just imposed. You also have the right to the assistance of an attorney to prosecute any appeal. If you can't afford an attorney, it won't be appointed for you at the public's expense. But if you would like to appeal, there's a document that we'll send over to you. Uh, you'll need to sign that document where indicated uh, and turn it into the jail, to the court, to your attorney within the next six months if you fail to do so. That appeal is waived. Do you understand, sir? Sir, do you understand? All right, uh, he must be off. Get it again. Do you understand your appellate rights, Mr. Akins? He is still muted. All right, if we can unmute the defendant. All right, Mr. Higgins, do you understand the appellate rights I've just read to you? Yes, Your Honor. 
All right, we'll provide this document to you uh, over at the jail. You get a chance to review it, and you can sign it over there if you choose to do so. I wish you the best of luck going forward, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, there you have it. There you have it. He, he had a, a near-death experience, the way he tells it. I, I will say this. Maybe, maybe it's... Uh, Maybe it's my chat's influence, but I'm more cynical about it this time than I was the first time. The first time I was like, yeah, I don't know. This guy, I kind of feel bad for him. I mean, I was, I was still skeptical, but I felt a little bad for him. And the second time through, it seemed even, I don't know, less believable. I, I don't see how... I'm no psychiatrist, but I don't see how he's he's a contractor, apparently does has jobs and, and can function. And and then he has these episodes. These episodes seem to me to be related to substance abuse. I mean, this is just speculation on my part. I don't know, but for DUIs, he's doing stuff. So I think I think he just gets out of control. I think he's got substance abuse problems and he and he gets out of control and then he's just a flaming a-hole. And I think the other thing it, that it, the other thing that really got me which I didn't catch the first time through was the prosecutor um talking about how he was trying to to cook the diagnosis for court. And that just put a whole different spin on it for me. But the, the judge, the judge put him in for what sixteen months. He's been in for two hundred days, he, so he's he's got some more time to serve, not that much, but but he's he's got he's got some more time to serve. I, th I you know, a lot of you are saying this. I think I think it's right. I think he probably just needs to sober up more than anything else. I don't know. This hearing is going on in <clears throat> Leelanau County. I don't know where he's going to jail. But if it's the jail I did yesterday, he's going to end up at the meth party. <laughs> and that won't help at all. I, I can't remember what county. Is, is that Antrim County? Crystal Mountain's in Benzie County. On the border of Manistee County. Yeah, geography with Mike. <laughs> Northern Michigan geography with Mike. I don't know what county he's going in, is my point. I don't know what county he's going in. But hopefully they don't have a good meth hookup, because this guy will be on board with it, I assure you. Ultimately, on, on second review, I think the judge got it right. And a lot of what a lot of what he was saying, he apparently got some uh, bipolar diagnosis out of some doctor. But most most of what he was saying wasn't even that. It was it was him and his YouTube medicine uh, on his own behalf. And it, you know, you know, I'm I'm a little skeptical of somebody's self diagnosis. I mean, this guy's doing bad stuff. He's threatening people. And and that's the pattern. It's it's not just like he, you know, like if you see someone with dementia or something, they kind of like space out and they get lost or they can't come back. I, you know, this is this guy. This guy turns nasty every time. That's the mo. I, I think that's, I think that's more, more personality issue and more intentional then he would have us believe. And that's kind of what the judge thought too. All right. I don't know. Why, why am I rambling? I have, I have no, I have no idea about any of this stuff. <laughs> I have zero idea. I have zero idea. I'm not an expert in medicine, substance abuse, anything else. That's just, that's just my uh, pointless gut reactions to all this. Thank you all for coming out. That was, that was a weird one. I'll see y'all soon.